I think we are ready to get started. So everybody find a seat or a perfect place to stand. <laughs> I'm Kate Wheeler. I'm the president and CEO of Crystal Cove Conservancy. And I am delighted to welcome you to the first in our 2022 speaker series. And even more delighted that I don't have to start it by telling you to put your Zoom screen in speaker view and your questions <laughs> in the chat. This is so much better. <laughs> um, before I get started, I just want to recognize a few people in the room. I will start with our founder and board member, Laura Davick. She's the founder of Crystal Cove Conservancy. Our board chair, Teddy Ray, in that fantastic hat. Glenn Bozarth, right next to Laura. Al Bennett, there's Al. He's the chair of our Education and Conservation uh, Committee. Shelly Tunin right here, who joined our board about a year ago. Tonight is really special. This building we're sitting next to, it's really special. All the people who are here tonight are really special. We're excited about this. Before I introduce our panelists, which I will in a minute, I'd like to introduce Tak Yamashita and Don Miata. Where are you? Tak? There's Tak. Tack and Don, excuse me. Here's Don, here's Tack. So Tack uh, lived here from 19, and Tack and Don, tell me if I get any of this wrong. Lived here from 1928 to 1942. He's described his childhood on the farm in idyllic terms. The memories he's shared with us are like so many along the Pacific coast. Long summer days spent at the beach, the imagination of a young boy blocks, turning blocks of wood into race cars and 18-wheelers and tractors. And I think it was all in the company of a good dog, a German shepherd. Uh, he has, w when he talked to our historians, he, he, just, he struggled to describe everything his mother did for their family. But he said that she rose in the morning before everyone else, and she was always the last one to bathe in the evenings before they turned in. The Yamashitas lived and worked on leased farmland, until they were forced to move to Utah, and then eventually Colorado, to, be, uh, to avoid being forcibly removed to incarceration camps. After receiving a degree in engineering from University of Colorado, good school, Tack was drafted into the US Army during the Korean War. His military career was remarkable. He got advanced training in guided missiles and high-speed computing. He studied business at UCLA and USC graduate schools. He went on to a career in computer systems technology until he retired in 1986 to travel with his wife, Betty, mm -hmm. and to spend more time with his children and his grandchildren. Tack, thank you for being here. Thanks for all you've done to make sure that your story and the story of so many families is, lives on here at Crystal Cove. Don Miata and his family moved to Crystal Cove in 1928 as well. And like Tack, remembers working his family's farm and farm stand with his mother, his father, and his sister. And he recalls long summer days, in his words, centered around the ocean, swimming, fishing, and looking for abalone. Mm -hmm. He remembers a, a, the softball team they formed and that he, they knew they were living, in his words, in a very chosen area, sort of a gold coast. He can't clearly remember the day his family left the ranch when they were removed and incarcerated in Poston. It was a month before he was meant to graduate from Newport Harbor Union High School. But he can recall a letter from his teacher, Mr. Anderson, who assured him that he had graduated in absentia. Mr. Anderson wrote, oh, this one's hard for me to get through. <laughs> when you have the time, I shall always appreciate hearing from you. And when this is all over, I'd surely enjoy seeing you again. In 1990, in, not 94, in 1944, Don was drafted into the US Army and served in Europe with the all Japanese American 442nd Regimental Combat Team until he was discharged in 1946. He used the GI Bill to pursue a career in medicine and received a PhD in chemistry in 1953 and went on to teach at UCI. Tack, Don, welcome home.
I'm also really pleased to welcome so many other members of the Japanese American community from here in Orange County and in Los Angeles. We're so glad you're here. So normally, before handing it over to our panelists, Blythe and Janice and Sandra, who I'll introduce properly in a moment, I'd start with some context about the Conservancy, who we are, and what our role is in the park. But tonight is different than, from that. So instead, I'll make it really simple. Crystal Cove Conservancy is the nonprofit partner to Crystal Cove State Park. We're working to restore the historic district and the backcountry and coastal habitats and to use them as outdoor classrooms and learning labs for students who have very little access to places like Crystal Cove. Tonight, to leave as much time as possible for our panelists and our guests and for your questions, I'm gonna leave it at that and turn to the topic at hand. The place that we call Crystal Cove State Park is a, has a long and storied history. We're located on the traditional unceded lands of the Ahashman and Tongva tribal nations. There are more than 40 documented historical and cultural sites in Crystal Cove State Park, including the Japanese language school. The first formal efforts, and now Blythe, you tell me if I get this wrong. The first formal efforts to tell the story of the Japanese American farming community at Crystal Cove began in 2005. Ish. Ish. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I can live with ish. Whenever Alexa started that report, I don't, <laughs> yeah. With interviews and photo records from farming family members, which informed the development of the interpretive panels that you see around us tonight. California State Parks is taking stock and critically re-examining re its past, looking at contested place names, monuments, and interpretation throughout the whole park system as part of its re-examining re our past initiative. Parks and park partners like Crystal Cove Conservancy are committed to identifying and removing derogatory place names, inappropriate honorifics, and inadequate interpretive programs and exhibits that falls short of contextualizing the history in California. In recent years, it's become really clear to us that this space um, and that the interpretation of these stories here at Crystal Cove feels a bit limited, both in terms of content and location. So we're exploring in partnership with, Cal with uh, Crystal Cove State Park and California State Parks, how we can um, reimagine how we tell this story here at Crystal Cove, the history of the Japanese American communi uh, farming community, and how we can center Japanese American voices in those stories. So let's do that. I'm delighted to introduce our panelists, Blythe Wilson, Janice Muna, sorry, Munamitsu, and Sandra Mendez Duran. Blythe Wilson, California State Parks Interpreter 3, has worked with parks since 2003 as an interpretive planner, historian, and educational leader. She has a passion for understanding how war and conflicts influence communities and identity. She was part of the team that developed the original interpretive exhibit here at the Japanese Language School. She conducted oral histories, which you'll hear a bit of later, and historical research, and developed a parks, helped develop the park's interpretive plan. Like her virtues and her areas of expertise, the ways in which Blythe has partnered with Crystal Cove Conservancy are just too long to list here. She's now the relevancy and uh, history manager for California's entire state park system, and her focus is on increasing awareness and community engagement on this part of our local history and really world history. Native of Orange County, Sandra Mendez Duran is a daughter of Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez and sister to Sylvia Mendez, who along with two of her brothers were denied admission to a white elementary school because of their family's Mexican heritage. It led to the lawsuit Mendez et al. v. Westminster, which was an early win for the desegregation movement, predating Brown versus Board of Education by seven years. Thurgood Marshall, who went on to be our uh, nation's first black U.S. Supreme Court justice, and uh, who also represented Oliver Brown in board, uh, Brown versus Board of Education, wrote a friend of, of the court brief uh, it, on behalf of the NAACP on that case. Janice, third generation Japanese American and author of The Color of Kindness, also a native of Orange County. Janice worked on her family's farm from the age of five all the way through high school. 
The Color of Kindness, for those of you who have not read it yet, tells the story of an incredible intersection of historical events for, the, for these two families. Here's how Sandra's sister, Sylvia, put it in the foreword for The Color of Kindness. Janice has diligently chronicled the unlikely story of both families and their interwoven journeys during the difficulty of 1940s America. Brought to life in these pages, you'll find the whole story of Mendez et al. v. Westminster and how two immigrant families with different heritages were inadvertently brought together by their separate battles with racism. Sylvia goes on to describe Janice's work not just as a chronicle of real difficulty, racial ignorance, and pain, but also kindness, grace, and collaboration that kept our hopes alive, that kept our hopes for a better future alive. And all of that is in keeping with Janice's family name, Munametsu, which means source of light. So with that, I want to turn it over first to Blythe, <laughs> and then we'll turn it over to Janice. So Blythe, right. take it away. I, I can't sit on this anymore. That's so okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have these, so there's choreography later. That's why we have these mics. <laughs> okay. Hello. Again, um, I'm Blythe Wilson, and I think I have to stay this way, stage this way. But, um, hi, I'm Blythe Wilson, and I've worked with Crystal Cove State Park for a very long time, uh, since um, I first got involved, I think, I think I met Laura Davick, and I, I went to her house, and she let me look at all of her archives, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is <laughs> great stuff. And then I, um, I was working with Alexa Clausen, who I think a few of you may know, and had the honor of working on the Japanese Language School Project, which was a story that um, really developed out of the photographs, the oral histories and the material that was developed from the people that lived here that actually are sitting in front of you. And I don't want to, I also I'm want to acknowledge you. Emiko Sugiira. Um, she also lived here during that time with Talk and Don. So it was from their oral histories and their photographs that we really know about what Crystal Cove was like before World War II and what it was like to actually you know, live here. You gave us a little bit of that snapshot. So, um, so in 2008, we developed the exhibits here, which are just a few panels, right? But at that time, it was a little bit, right? And it was really came from the materials that you all supplied the state, and that was amazing. But now, fast forward 2022, and we're sitting here today. I think that there could be so much more that we could do together. So what I'm going to do is not tell you about the history too much. I'm going to let you see some of the photographs and hopefully listen to some of the oral histories that came from Crystal Cove. So we'll see if the audio works. <laughs> All right, I don't know if you can see this, but I believe um, it was this talker, Don, that created Don. Yes, you worked with Alexa, I believe, and identified each of the farm families along the coast. So if you look here, this is Pacific Coast Highway. And do we know in 1927 what was happening that that kind of became the beginning of the Japanese farming here? What would happen in 1927, do you think? Well, the development of Pacific Coast Highway, right? So, so that's when we began to see these families moving to the area and developing farm stands, and that type of thing. And of course, it wasn't Crystal Cove at this, <laughs> it wasn't Crystal Cove State Park back then, right? It was the Irvine land. So here's a few pictures. We're going to get to the next slide here. All right, um, this may look familiar. <laughs> um, OK, so this is a photo from that I believe you provided of our, is that the farm here, right? And I want to listen to what you had to say. I don't know if you remember this. I hope that it's okay. Um, about light, about how this farm was developed and about what your, your dad had to say. So he was constantly looking for uh, more <laughs> fertile land, mm -hmm. uh, a larger partial uh, where he could uh, 
expand his business as a farmer. Uh, he just had a knack of, of raising vegetables, and so and he took a lot of pride in it. But he also was uh, very innovative. He always took advantage of newer things that came. And so he came, he was evidently, he drove on Highway, highway 1 and came across this parcel of land with, uh, which was owned by Irvine here in Laguna Beach. And he just thought it would be a wonderful place. It was, you know, sagebrush, bushes, and rocks. And he knew he had to remove all that. But he somehow got in contact with Mr. Irvine. And they seemed to hit it off. And he negotiated a long-term lease because Mr. Irvine would not sell the land. Right. Okay. So a long-term lease. And my father promised that he would make uh, capital improvements on the land if he would give him that long-term lease. And he would also say, he, my father promised to clean up the area with all the grass alongside the highway. And so that's when he started and he built, hand built his first home by himself. It was a, f a wood frame home, ho house with, uh, he used hand tools and we were in Vista yet. Okay, so he, he cleared the land, he built this house and the house was about 850 square feet. That's all for the family of seven. Yeah. And uh, so we moved in, uh, several weeks after I was born. And so that's kind of the background of. Well, there, there was more that you said, but I had to cut it off. We could listen all day long, but, but yeah. So yeah, I mean, just imagine, I can't imagine what it must have been like during that time, but we can a little bit imagine because of the photographs and oral histories about what that might've been like. Let's move on here. This is a little bit blurry, but it's a, a photo of a farm stand right probably on Pacific Coast Highway. And this may look familiar to you. Yes, I think you just shared this with me too here, Mr. Miata. Um, and so this is um, the family produce stand. And, and I believe I have, oh, sorry about that. Um, and it's a family produce stand um, and with Regu Miata, owner and wife of Matsu and daughter Ruth. And this is from your personal photo collection. So that's a really amazing photo. If you just, if you can see this, you can see really the details of all the things that were grown and all the things that were sold during that time. It's a really fascinating, amazing photograph. So, move on. And Emiko, <laughs> Um, these photographs may look familiar to you as well. Um, so these photos actually were after we developed the 2008 exhibit. I think we met you and Nicole and we were like, oh, look at these photos. We gotta, we gotta do this. We gotta get your oral history and look at these photos. So you provided some amazing photos. Um, you can see here, the, that's kind of the El Moro area, right in the background there in the hills. Um, and you are right next to the Ashida family, I believe you said. Uh, I have a little bit of a clip here that I really thought was good that described what you grew. Post highway. Yes, uh, how we had strawberry fields and cucumbers and the co corn and string beans and all the dry farming was right around here. He grew tomatoes up here. And up here, this was all his farmland. And this was, and then tomatoes growing up in the hills because it was dry. And down in the valley where we had the irrigation is where we had the corn and strawberries. And, At, yeah. By just by little and trucks a, and tractors. Uh, yeah. And at first we didn't have the trucks. We had horses, horses you know, right. to do the plowing. And, and so he accomplished a lot in 10 years. And I think when you were saying he, you were talking about your father and your family there. Yeah, I just put a little clips in here just to give you a flavor of the amazing um, contributions of everybody that has contributed these photos and oral histories. I have a few more, I think. Um, so bear with me. Hopefully we're doing okay on you're, time. You're doing okay. Okay. Um, these are a few more of the photos that you provided after our exhibits, and I wanted to show them here of the, mostly the Ashidas, 
So those are fabulous photos. You can see right here, the, back, the, the crates sit in the back. I think that's the Morro Canyon area. And you can see Midori and Hasako with their, their dogs there. It's a very cute photo. I love that photo. And uh, this is Hasako, and, and this is Ashida. So you were very nice to label all those. As <laughs> you saved us a lot of work on that one, so thank you. <laughs> um, and I love these photos of you, Emiko. And um, you said that you danced in kimono at the Laguna Beach Festival of the Arts and also at the Nisei Week Parade in Los Angeles. So those are awesome photos that we didn't have before our event in 2008, so thank you for contributing those. <laughs> and so back to the subject here, our Japanese language school. I have, um, this is also some photos that Emiko provided. Uh, you see the Japanese language school. It could have been San Joaquin too up the street. We don't know exactly, but um, I'll let Don talk about that actually. There's a clip that you have. Well, the Japanese about school that. moved around <laughs> a little bit. Uh, first, it was at, uh, at Mr. Matsuyama's house for a couple years, then I went to the uh, San Joaquin number two. We had it there for about three years. And then we moved over to the, the uh, last uh, place, which is the Japanese, Japanese school, which they had built as a community center Japanese school. Was, you had a, actually, you had a really long oral history, I think, that was done like in four parts in 2014, like a very extensive one. So there's lots of great material that you provided. I remember, that was just a clip <laughs> there. But, um, but also, here's a clip from Tom Honda. I don't know if he's lo any longer with us. I don't know if we know, but Someone. yeah, he's, I don't know if he's passed on. But um, yeah, here's a clip from, from Tom. We were in this building one time when uh, some uh, military came here and they wanted to know why we were here. And we told them because this was also kind of a little recreational facility for those of us who like to play ping pong or something like that, you know. When we would come here frequently, since we lived so close by, my brothers and I used to come here quite often to play ping pong and that sort of thing, practice softball and all that. Um, cool. One more uh, we were kind of dawdling. We hated to have to go home because uh, Mrs. Gardner, who was our teacher, was a very beloved lady. Everyone just loved her to death and none of us wanted to leave. All the kids just hung around and, and she was in the back room crying and she really knew what was... Oh yeah, she had been told and so she finally came out and she says, kids, please go home, <laughs> you know, and she pleaded with us to leave because she was so heartbroken and we were too, you know, we hated to leave her behind, you know. Yeah, and, and such a shocking kind of... Uh, it was quite a shock, you know, it was not something that we would have dreamed could have happened to us, yeah. you know, it just uh, was totally... Uh, it was just devastating yeah. in some ways. And so here's a few other photos. And you know, the, the California State Parks really didn't understand the significance of this building, I think, until um, the restoration of the first phase of restoration when that you know, the board was found. I don't know if you were there, Laura, when that was found, but yeah, it was, it said Japanese, or uh, Laguna Beach Japanese Language School constructed July 24th, 1934. And um, Mr. Saburo, as the person in charge of the construction, Mr. Honda said they called the community <coughs> center the Laguna Beach Language School. So that that is kind of what tipped off, like, hey, there's a, there's a story here. And even though the language school was moved after World War II, you know, when the Coast Guard took it over and was moved to this location, it was 
a little bit up the street from what I understand. Um, that really helped the state parks really think about what this place was and that's why today we call it a, a cultural center. So these are some photos, I don't know if you remember from 2008 I was going through um, when we, we opened the exhibits. Um, the same exhibits are here, <laughs> so we could do better, but, um, but I think that uh, uh, I, I will just read this final clip if that's, or I'll just let you listen to this final clip if that's okay, and um, I'll be done with my presentation. <laughs> okay. Wow, post in Arizona, and, uh, and actually, and they told us we could pack up whatever we want, um, well, whatever equipment, mostly clothing, and the other things we gave away, or uh, and we stored some, and we left some with some people uh, that we knew. Well, we didn't know; it's a friend of ours knew about it, and then. But when we came back, it was all gone. Yeah, and we couldn't find that person either. And um, I don't, I just want to read this really quickly. Uh, thank you to all who contributed photos, oral histories, and ephemera related to the Issei and Issei experience within the Crystal Cove area prior to World War II. Due to Executive Order 9066 mandating incarceration and removal of all people of Japanese descent from the West Coast, families who lived here for over a decade lost their farms, possessions, and homes. The Cultural Center at Crystal Cove State Park aims to serve as a place of remembrance, learning, community building, and healing. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Blythe. <laughs> Got that. Okay. Blythe, thank you so much. Uh, I imagine this is a really wonderful night for you. You've put so much into this space and um, brought so many people along, and I'm just so delighted for you that we were able to do this together. I think Keon's going to switch our present. Oh, already did it. Uh, I would like to turn it over to you, Janice, and Keon will uh, advance your slide. Just okay. give him a give him a thumbs up when you want him to. Okay. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for te your team, your conservancy team, uh, for arranging this and for having interest in this story. Um, our story. We're going to take you more inland, uh, inland Orange County to Westminster. And the first picture we have up here is myself and Sylvia Mendez, who is Sandra's older sister. Uh, Sylvia was actually uh, forced to go to a Mexican school, not the regular public school, when she moved on our family farm. And I'll tell you how that happened. So the first picture, uh, we can advance it. Um, this is a picture of Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendez, and then also my grandparents, Sema and Masako Munamitsu. Um, Felicitas came from Puerto Rico and Gonzalo came from Mexico as young uh, children with their families to work here in America and ended up in uh, the Westminster area. Uh, separately, my grandfather came in 1916. He was about 17 years old and then uh, went back, married my grandmother, and she came back in 1921. They started out in Carson area, worked on a ranch there, but in 1930, he was able to lease a farm in Westminster, and that was a great opportunity. Um, in those days, because of the alien land laws and other restrictions, um, there was a lot of prejudice, and so he was really able to find a woman, she was elderly, who would lease her land to him. So my dad was about 10 years old at that time, and they moved to Westminster to farm. You can advance it. So these are some pictures of my grandfather, what Westminster looked like in 1930. No shopping malls, no subdivisions, no uh, fast food outlets, right? It was farmland. Um, if you're interested or uh, if you know a little bit about Westminster, it's kind of where Edwards, 17th Street, um, Beach Boulevard, and kind of in that area is where he was. Um, my grandfather was so fortunate. This woman, um, I mentioned she was elderly, but she actually, when she passed, she gave my grandfather first right of refusal to purchase the land. And that was a great opportunity, except for the alien land laws at that time. Um, could not, he could not buy it because he wasn't a citizen of the U.S. So my father, who was only about 10 years old at the time, 
um, found, they found a guardian who was a Japanese American of about 22 years old, a family friend, who was a born citizen of America. And he became my guardian, uh, my father's guardian. So my father had a guardian for the real estate transaction, but he actually had a mother and father, uh, you know. So it was only to, to be able to buy the land, but my father was a, a, a very young um, landowner. Um, but that was one of really such a blessing. I mean, that opportunity would not have happened. So they farmed uh, successfully. My dad, I don't know if anyone's from Huntington Beach High School, but my dad graduated from Huntington Beach. My mother was born in Santa Ana. She went to Santa Ana High School. Um, and uh, she actually, her graduation, she was in the post and internment camp um, her senior year. So, but she did um, graduate from high, uh, Santa Ana High School. It's hard for me to see that. So no. I, yeah, sorry. What? Okay, so this is a farm picture of my dad, um, his high school picture from Huntington Beach High School, and you could see the farm. Um, my grandmother's in that picture, my uncle, and a family friend with her young son. If you, um, if you have the book, this picture, these pictures are all in the book as well, but this picture actually shows the farmland, and in the distant back of it, there are four farm cottages, and those were workers' cottages. There was a family house and four workers' cottages. And those cottages become important when we meet Sandra's family. So I'll just point that out. Um, you can go ahead, Beth. Okay, and this is a family fic picture. Um, it's my grandfather, my grandmother, my uncle, and then my, uniquely, my uh, dad had two twin sisters who were about 13 years younger. So they were only about seven years old at this time. Um, they're both still living. Um, they're 86 and, and very active, very energetic. But um, they have a very different perspective of this story because they were only seven years old. And when they were in May of 1942, when they were to leave for the camp, my aunts had the chicken pox. So mm -hmm. they couldn't go, obviously. That would be very dangerous to spread. So they stayed in a hospital here in Westminster while my grandmother and her oldest son, my dad, and um, uncle went to camp. And my grandmother actually, uh, I just really can't even believe what she went through because just a few days before that, and I think it's the next picture, um, my grandfather was arrested by the FBI, accused of being a spy. And this was pretty typical. In fact, is Ron, there he is. So Ron, who I just met today, uh, but we've been talking, his grandfather, my grandfather, and a couple other uh, men were all taken at about the same time. Um, they weren't spies. My grandfather had lived in America for 26 years at this time. But because of the um, prejudice and bias, because of Japan bombing Pearl Harbor, there was a lot of suspicion. And so my grandmother, her husband, got taken by the FBI on the 14th of May. And on the 17th of May, they leave to go to this unknown um, post and internment camp in the middle of the Arizona desert on Native American land. So that is kind of the story but how we then connect with Sandra's family is my dad had a very very wonderful mentor in Mr. Monroe at uh, First National Bank of Garden Grove and Mr. Monroe had really mentored my dad but this was a big decision you know what do you do with the farm you've heard that people lost everything they sold it they got nothing for it Mr. Monroe said let's lease it Let's find someone to lease the farm. And this is the house, everything in it, the barn, the cottages, the crops in the field. We're leasing the whole thing. Um, and my dad had never met Mr. Mendez before. It was only through the friendship of Mr. Monroe that he met Mr. Mendez. And that is what happened. That's how our families are connected, is my dad leased the farm to Sandra's parents. And I'll let her take it from there. <laughs> well. Um, from, I'm the youngest daughter of Gonzalo and Felicitas Mendez, and so the story that I'm telling you was told to me. And if there's any, if you're native to Orange County or this area, and you've never heard the story before, don't feel bad because I didn't hear the story till I went away to college. <laughs> I was in the university, 
happened to be flipping through a book, saw my parents' names, and I knew that they could not be too many Felicitas and Gonzalo Mendeses in the world. <laughs> um, uh, at that time, I, those of you who remember that we didn't have cell phones, we had to leave the dorm, go down, wait in line and for a pay phone. I called my mother and I said, I'm reading a book. And her response was, oh, it's in a book. <laughs> so what happened is they leased the farm the Munimito farm. They went there and then they invited um, my father's sister and husband, my aunt and uncle, to stay on the farm with him. They were going to farm this land. They didn't know how long they would be there. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they went there. And as they're getting busy uh, settling in, getting ready to run the farm, they decided that my aunt would take my parents' three children my sister Sylvia, my brother Jerome, and my brother Gonzalo Jr., and their three children, and take them and register at the school that would be closest to them. When you move somewhere, you go to the school closest to you. Well, when they took my, they, they said my aunt went to take them to school, and my aunt is, although she's Mexican, uh, from Mexico, she was married to a man from Mexico, but his last name was Vidari, which is a French name. Well, my cousins are very fair-skinned, light hair, light eyes. So when they arrived at the school, they told my aunt, we'll take those three, but we won't take those three. The other three were my siblings. We're all dark-complected. Our last name was Mendez. And she said, no, you don't understand. We live right here. We live in the district. And she said, I'm sorry. We, don't, we won't take those. We'll take yours. We won't take those. You take them to the Mexican school which is down the street, which was a shack, uh, an awful building. And um, she went home. She said, well, I'm not going to leave my children. She went home and told my father. And my father, being a man, said, you got this wrong. I'll take care of it. I'll take care of it. We all know men like, men like that, not all of them. <laughs> but <laughs> I'll take care of it. Let me do it. I'll deal with it tomorrow. Well, he went to the school and he said, you don't understand, we do live in this district. Uh, we lease the farm and uh, we belong here. And they told him, no, the, the Mexican, all non-white children go to the Mexican school. And um, he went home uh, wrong, he was wrong, he didn't take care of it. And together they decided that this was not okay. This was not okay, they wanted to fix it. They were told by one of the uh, truckers, one of their friends, about an attorney, and he was of Jewish descent, David Marcus, that David Marcus had fought a similar situation where Mexicans were denied access to, uh, to uh, what's the school, to the park, right? And the Westminster the School. The Westminster School. So my parents uh, had money at the time because they were now working the farm, and they now had the income from the crops, thanks to the Munamitsu family. And they um, threw their own money, with their own money, their own, they went knocking on doors and st with, with the attorney, trying to drum up enough interest to file a, long suit, a lawsuit. And they were able to take f uh, five other families or four of the families and get together and file a lawsuit. In March 1944, they filed the lawsuit. And this went on, and my parents would have to drive all the time to, the, to downtown Los Angeles. It was not here. They would fight the case. They would take my sister and my brothers every day, dress them up, braid my sister's hair, dress them, take them to court and all day. And with a lot of people that wouldn't support them. People were afraid. The people of Mexican descent said, I don't want any part of this, I'm afraid. And, and if they left their work, they would lose a day's pay and they couldn't afford a day's pay. So my parents actually paid some of those people to go to court with them. And they, um, they fought the case with David Marcus's support and with the support, like you mentioned, Thurgood Marshall, the NAACP, the Jewish American Congress. They, a lot of support from a lot of, a lot of other people, uh, and like Jenna says, this is a story, this is not a story about brown and white, 
Well, yellow and white is a story of a lot of different colors, a lot of different people that came in to support it, my parents and the other families. They won the, they won the case, but right before they won the case, well, one thing I want to mention is that they said to my father, if you drop this lawsuit, we'll let your kids go to this school. Just stop mm -hmm. this nonsense. We'll let your three kids in. And my father told them, it's not about my three children. It's about what's right. So they tried to convince him to drop the suit and just let his three kids quietly go to the white school. And my sister tells me all these, she just, they just wanted to go to school. And you'll read in Janice's book, because Janice did so much research, that while the case was being fought, my siblings had to go to the Mexican school. So they would get on the bus with all the kids. And all, you know, there was no prejudice among the children. They were all friends. They would get on the bus, and the bus would take them to the white school, drop all the children off. And from there, my siblings had to walk to the Mexican school, because even the bus wouldn't go to the Mexican school. But they did win the case. But the case, of course, there was a, uh, help me, <laughs> the, the appeal. appeal, appeal. They appealed the case. So the case was won, but in it was not finally set. It was settled till 1947. And this case, because Thurgood Marshall was involved, he filed a friend of the court brief, Judge Robert Carter was involved. And at that time, Earl Warren was our governor. These people went on to do the Brown versus Board of Education. And so many people in this country believe Brown desegregated everything, but it started here in Southern California. So that was the precedent. But our families went from tragedy to triumph, I think. <laughs> and my sisters tell me of driving all the way to Poston to make sure they took the money to the Munimitsu family because they didn't trust anybody. They were afraid somebody would not get the money to them. Family returns, right? Your, mm -hmm. your family returns to the farm, and pretty soon the families are living together, running the farm. I'm going to let you go from there when your family okay. returns. Um, this is <laughs> 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 Thank you. So I think one of the favorite stories in the book is um, Gonzalo and Felicitas are fighting this case. It wasn't settled until 47, but in 1945, our family comes back. Mm -hmm. And those four cottages, as I mentioned, were workers' cottages. Um, so my dad and Gonzalo, and this is written, um, the lease documents are at Chapman University, but they actually have a very unique arrangement. My dad, in the lease document, said, when we come back, date kind of unknown, but sometime in the next year, when we come back to the farm, we'll live in the workers' cottages. You guys stay in the, the main house. And then we will work for you, Gonzalo, and you can pay us the lease money and the daily wages. Because Sylvia, and I didn't know this until Sylvia told me, but Sylvia um, and her mother said the reason that was important is if Gonzalo moved out of Westminster back to his home in Santa Ana, uh, the, he had to be in Westminster School <laughs> District to win this case. Mm -hmm. The other thing is he had spent his, his rightly earned money on this court case. He funded, and that's why Mendez comes before Palomino, Ramirez, Estrada, and Guzman. Um, the other families involved in the case is because uh, uh, Gonzalo funded most of it off the asparagus profits. So for about a year, Sylvia's, um, Sylvia Gonzalo and Jerome, her siblings, and my two aunts uh, were kind of playmates. Mm -hmm. They were all about seven, eight, nine years old at the time and they were all playmates for that year when my dad worked for your dad mm -hmm. and her dad paid my dad lease money. So it's kind of one of those switching, you know, trading places things, but I think what it shows is just the spirit of collaboration and um, I hope you'll read The Kindness of Color. Just uh, the reason I call it that is it is, it's the kindness of everyday people doing what they can for their neighbor, strangers, uh, my grandmother, there's some things in there, we don't even know who these people are, but they truly impacted giving her hope for the future when there didn't seem to be any hope. Um, and our, our great guests here, you know, they actually lived through that. But um, I hope you'll read it, but we're, this is really, we really want to um, just tell the story of true kindness making a difference, um, a very lasting difference, not only for our families, but also um, for all the children of California. Thank you. Thanks. Good job. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you all so much. That was really wonderful. I have a few, can we ask some questions? Sure. All sure. right. Um, so I want to start with you, Janice. I was struck when I read the book um, by how prominently kindness plays in your story. Uh, but also in what I've read from both Don and Tack, uh, you know, Don's teacher making sure that he graduated. Uh, many of these families, talks, yours, others, relied on white folks um, to help with land leases, to help, you know, make sure that their, um, their equipment and their, their uh, land was taken care of. Um, can you speak a little bit about that, how, how you've been able to stay focused on those really wonderful acts of kindness and allyship? Um, and, and how, because it, I am struck by it's the kindness of color and you really focus on that mm -hmm. piece of it. Can mm -hmm. you talk a little bit about how you've been able to stay focused there? I think it started, uh, Sylvia and I had talked um, at quite a few different in-person events and I think the one that was really striking is we spoke at a Prudential headquarters in New Jersey, at their new Newark global headquarters, um, to, their, to their employees. And we would talk about the case and everything, but they just kept wanting to go back to the family stories. And I just thought, really, are these that interesting? And Sylvia, her sister, was like, I guess so. Mm -hmm. We'll just keep talking about it. So I realized that the human part of this story was really important, and I think um, my family was just very loyal to Mr. Monroe. I mean, I did not get to meet Mr. Monroe, my dad's mentor. He had passed by the time I was born, but I do remember every single Christmas we would go visit his widow, Mrs. Monroe. And um, when I remember as a young kid saying, Dad, how do we know Mrs. Monroe? Because she was an elderly white woman. Um, he goes, her, fa or her husband was a very good friend to me. Now, I wish as a little kid I had asked more, but mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, that's mm -hmm. nice, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but we really realize just the pivots of these, the story, um, and it is throughout the whole book. I mean, Sylvia uh, verbally has relayed so many of those, um, and they're almost chance encounters, and I think it just shows how important it is. You don't really know. I mean, nobody in this book knows that I put them in there. <laughs> you know, the truck driver mm -hmm. who gave Gonzalo some mm -hmm. advice, or the, nobody knows that they're in there, but they, had, they listened, they understood what the, the situation, the problem was, and they did what they could. And I think that's really why I want, I mean, even in the most desperate things, I mean, my parents had, they couldn't reverse 9066. Um, and there's a lot of things in the book that are very Japanese culture, like people will go, I can't believe they do that. I'm like, well, yeah. I mean, it's just kind of inbred. And I, some of my, um, th my colleagues here that we're all the same age, it's like, oh yeah, that's what we do. You know, that's our Asian culture, our Japanese heritage. So that's in the book too. But I think um, my parents for, and grandparents just were very grateful for the people who did help and who did um, show kindness or compassion or lend a hand or offer their friendship. Um, they had lived here. My grandfather was here 26 years before this happened. So he had friends, you know, of Japanese as well as white and Mexican. Uh, we had Mexican workers and friends. So I think that's really the mm -hmm. key. That's why I wanted to focus on this. I, and I didn't intend to write a book. I'm kind <laughs> of the reluctant author, but um, my friends uh, who run Orange County Department of Education, they're like, Janice, this is important. You need to write it down. I'm like, really? <coughs> um, but they were very instrumental in saying, we should document this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so Sandra, I was interested when you said, well, we spend a lot of time in parks thinking about how we tell stories, mm -hmm. how to tell mm -hmm. stories. And I'm interested when you said that um, you didn't know about this until you read about it in a book in college. Can you speak a little bit about that, about how, we, uh, maybe if you understand why the story wasn't told and is it told now? Well, from, from that moment when I called my mom, she said, it's in a book. And I said, well, yeah, this is kind of a big deal, mom. <laughs> and she said, well, and I asked her to tell me the story and she, you know, condensed it down to a few words, you know, there was, what was happening was not right, and we set out to fix it for everyone, not just for us. But then um, the, the case ended, the family returned home, the Munimitsu family returned home, our parents finished that crop, and, you know, sadly, they pretty much lost 
the other part of the story is they pretty much lost everything because they spent whatever money they were making on the case and paying people and, and everything they had to do. So they came back and so for them it was more of a, it was a triumph but it was also sad because it was a difficult situation because now they come back and they really, they still had their home but now my dad had to look for a job and now he was just one more Mexican laborer. So that part of it was not a happy time for them even though they won the case and they did something that just now is becoming, people are becoming aware of what a, what a big deal it was. Mm -hmm. At that time, they didn't see it as that important. So they never, mm -hmm. I, the case settled in 47. I was born in 50 and I never heard about it, you know. So they just did not talk about it. It was never taught in schools. Mm -hmm. There is no record of it other than when we started doing research and we found the court records and that type of thing, but there was, it, it was treated as no big deal. So in that sense, my family took that on as it was no big deal mm -hmm. and just left it aside. Mm -hmm. Sadly, my father died when I was 13, so he never got to see that eventually the story took momentum. Mm -hmm. Eventually, they now have um, a high school in Los Angeles named Mendez, a middle school in Santa Ana named Mendez, um, my mother was alive when the middle school was uh, named Mendez mm -hmm. and sat in the, in, the, in the school board and they said, well, we don't name schools after people that are alive. And my mother said, well, excuse me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> my, uh, if you know, if you read the story, my mother was a tough cookie. She was about as our height, but she ran the entire farm while this case was going on, including all the workers, including cooking for everyone. So she stood her ground at that, at that school board meeting and they did pass to name the school after them. Since then, my sister, who, by the way, is the speaker of the family, I'm not the speaker, this is <laughs> something that Janice got me into, but um, <laughs> she received the Medal of Freedom from uh, President Obama for her efforts because as my mother was dying, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. My sister was a, a, a registered nurse at Los Angeles County General, and when my mother was dying, um, my mother said, no one knows about this case, and your dad died sadly. Please go out and tell someone about this. And long story short, my sister just wrote letters to some schools and said, my name is, I am one of the, the persons involved in this case, would you like to hear? So. She has used, like my dad, she has used her own money, her own time, and has been all over the country trying to teach people that someone fought for your right to stay in school and you need to stay in school. So that was why she received the Medal of Freedom. There was also a documentary in 2002, 2001, yeah. and the person who did the documentary, uh, also an Orange County native, brought the families back together. Mm -hmm. And we've been, we've been close ever since. And uh, Aki, who is her aunt, mm -hmm. uh, was the one that played with my sister in the, on the farm. They got back in touch and it's been, it's been wonderful. So out of tragedy, something wonderful did happen. So. Mm -hmm. Really wonderful. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, to finish us up, Blythe, I wonder if you could share a little bit about Parks, re-examining the past, and if you have other projects going on, like how we're thinking about how do we interpret this space more co more fully and in the context of the times. Yeah, well, you know, since since I guess we're here, I'd, I'd just like to talk about the cultural center, the Japanese language school, and just how it's an opportunity to really engage our community and discuss these things. and talk about the past, you know, and make sure that we know these stories and we don't forget them. You know, I think that's a big um, thing that California State Park should be doing is in all of our historic sites is re-looking re at what stories are told and making sure that we are, you know, stories are reflective of everybody and that we are 
places that everyone feels comfortable in. So I mean, I it's, imagine. It's, yeah, I imagine it's, that's part of being <laughs> in the interpretive world yeah. is that you have to reinterpret at times and rethink how we're telling stories and, sort of ongoingly. And, and I think, you know, you might notice I didn't do a lot of talking here in my presentation. I think that the more we can really listen to others, the more genuine and just real our interpretation of spaces are going to be what you know those first person photographs those narratives are really what connect us as humans i think so i think that's what i'd really like to see at state parks more of you know that that human connection and, and bringing in those stories of, of everyone that is connected to a place so <laughs> thank you three all so much it's been really fun to hear from you and i have loved reading the book and reading what you, the reports that you and your team have put together at Blythe, I think we have, I mean, there's just so much in there. I hope you all um, read The Color of Kindness. It is really a wonderful uh, story. I want to just close tonight um, with something Harry Yamashita said about, the sa about Saturday school here at the Japanese Language School. We didn't study. We would go there and play baseball and football. <laughs> We'd take the Sunday funnies. My job when I, when I was a kid was to go down and suck that pump up. I don't know if you remember the old pumps, one cylinder with a big flywheel, plunk, plunk, plunk. We'd swim and fish and get abalone and octopus. During the depression, the highway was over here and it would rain and the tramps would come by. I was just a kid, scared mm. the daylights out of me. <laughs> they wanted to sleep in the barn, you know? We had kerosene lamps, then graduated to gas lamps. My job was to clean those things, the jets. When I was in high school, I was in charge of the tractor. We had a caterpillar, and I would do all the fields. I ruined my back. The folks, they didn't know any better. In the old days, the caterpillars were like tanks, no springs, nothing. <laughs> and Tom Honda, another child of the era, said, I was sort of a latchkey kid. I can relate. <laughs> so my job was to cook the rice so it would be hot when they got home from work. We used to have picnics down at the beach at the end of the season. If the season was successful, we'd have a picnic and we'd have foot races in the sand and sumo wrestling. I used to go look for arrowheads and Indian artifacts and every time it rained, I would immediately go out and check these gullies because in the walls of these gullies, there would be arrowheads and other things sticking out. At low tide, we would go with a gunny sack and pry abalone off the rocks without even getting wet. So let's close there with those words and all of these memories ringing in our ears. Thank you all so much for coming. This was really fun. Thank you so much. Don, Tack, rest of the community, thank you. Good? Good.